Welcome back to our Django 2.0 inch by inch series. This is class one of Django Forms. The agenda for this particular training class is first an overview of Django Forms. What are they? Then we'll create a basic form and explain every part and piece of it as we go along. We'll make sure that we leave no stone unturned. We wanna make sure you have a really good foundation. And finally, we'll show you how the view, the template, and the URL configuration or the URL pattern must be configured to support a Django form. So let's jump right in. Forms or HTML forms are a collection of elements inside form tags. They allow a visitor of a Django driven website to do things like enter text, select options, manipulate options or controls and then send that information back to the web server. Some of these form interface elements, as they're known, like text input or checks, check boxes, are fairly simple and are built into HTML itself. Then there are others that are more complex, an interface that pops up a date picker or allows you to move a slider or manipulate controls, typically use JavaScript and CSS as well as HTML form input elements to achieve their effect. Along with the input tag elements, a form must specify two things, where and how. The where is the URL the user's input should be returned to. The how is the HTTP method, the get the post, that data should be returned by. Let's take a closer look at the HTTP get and post methods. The post method, Django's login form is returned using the post method in which the browser will bundle up the form data that you send. It will encode it for transmission, send it to the server, and then receive back its response. The get method, by contrast, bundles the submitted data into a string. It uses it to compose a URL. The URL contains the address where the data must be sent, as well as the data keys and values. So an example of this could be that you go visit the Django project website. You click on the documentation link. You do a search for the word forms. And one of the URLs that you will get back is what I show you here. And you'll see the question mark Q equals forms, right? That is taking what we put in that form field and showing it in plain text. So let's talk about best practices and why we want to use post for some things and get for others. Any request that could change the state of your application data should use the post method. Get is safe for queries, read operations, and lookups. But if you're going to change state of the application or your database, you want to use the post. Here is the comparison between the two. Forget all required data is stored in the URL, clear text. For post, additional parameters to the server are sent in the message body. For get, parameters remain in the browser history. For post, they're not saved in the browser history. For get, it can be bookmarked. For post, cannot be bookmarked. You're starting to get why this is important here, right? For get, requests are re-executed but may not be resubmitted to the server if the HTML is stored in the browser cache. For post, the browser usually alerts the user that data will need to be resubmitted. For get, parameters sent data is limited to what goes into the request line URL, usually limited to 2048 characters. Should not be used to send sensitive information. It's visible to all in the browser bar. Anything seen in the browser would also be stored in the server logs, and that is in plain text. For post, you can send parameters, including uploading files, to the server. There is no size or length limitation. Variables are not displayed in the URL. For the get, it can be cached, and for the post, it cannot be cached. So again, the thing you want to take away from this slide is any request that could change the state of your application's data, you want to use post. So let's take a look at what we'll build. What will it look like? Well, here you see under number one, we're going to log on to this particular URL against my development server, and we'll have a simple form with just one field that says your name, where you'll put your name in, and a submit button. When that button gets submitted, we will redirect the user to a different web page. That's all we're gonna do. We're gonna find out exactly how to do that and build the foundation. So what technology in terms of the Django framework should I be familiar with before I venture down this path of learning about forms? 
Well, there are three things that you really should know. You should understand a bit about views, about the URL configuration and patterns, and also about templates. If you are familiar with these three objects and how to construct them, then I think you're ready for forms. If not, I would suggest that you go back through some of the very good information out there to get yourself familiar. So, so this will make sense because we can't build a form in isolation. We have to build a form relative to these other Django objects and files. What specific Django objects will we need to build or implement to facilitate our simple one-line form? Here is our list. We'll need two views, one to support our form and one to support a redirect view. We'll need our form itself. We'll need two supporting URL patterns, one for our form and one to support the redirect. And then we'll need two templates, one to present our form and one to present the redirected view. And on this slide, we're going to build our form. Here is our form. We've named it name form. It happens in the form of a Python class. So we see in the yellow box, class space name form. It inherits from the form class, which happens to live in forms.py. It's a Django module. In the body of our form, in our class, we see the variable your underscore name. And all that is, is one char field with a label of your name at a max length of 100. Let's look very closely at we, what we have in the page and what we create and what we see on the screen, what gets rendered back. First of all, we must import forms.py to support the creation of the name form because as I mentioned before, it inherits from the form class which happens to live in the forms module. So we have forms.form, right? The form class uppercase lives in the forms.py module. The form class is a collection of fields plus their associated data. It and of itself inherits from the base form class, which also lives in the forms.py file. So you get forms.baseform. So you see our entire form, our entire class that creates the form is in that yellow box, two lines, the header and the indented body of the class. But now let's look, this is what that looks like this is what gets rendered to the user. So let's look at some observations between the code we created and what we see. All the form gives us is the one your underscore name character field. That's all it gives us. What we see is the label we've created. Y, capital Y-O-U-R, lowercase n-a-m-e, which is exactly what we put in the label. If we change the label, it'll change how it's rendered on the screen. We have not specified the submit button in the form code we created, yet it shows up. How can that be? We're going to get to that in the slides that, that are upcoming. Where does the other text, like my user form and the user form, come from? We didn't specify it in our form code above, so how does it appear on the screen? We'll talk about the other objects and files that make that work in Django. So this is just our form view again, but there's a few perks of this form class that I want to mention. The field, your underscore name, has been given a label of your name. Although the same name would have been the one that Django provides automatically based on the field name. So there are things that happen in the background automatically. If I left out label, it would have been the same in this case. The field max length is 100. The browser should prevent the user from entering a string this long in the first place, but Django will also validate that this is the case because of the setting. This happens because of the is valid method that this form instance will go through. It validates all fields. If all fields contain valid data, the following things will happen. The form will return true, and the form's data will be placed using the clean underscore data attribute. As always, our view does the heavy lifting, so we will spend most of our time in this presentation on this one slide. This is our view that supports the form. You see at top, this is what our form looks like. We've seen it before. This form serves two purposes. It first publishes the unbound form, right? That's the blank form, the form with no data. It then processes the bound form data that is sent back to our server. 
So what happens here? Right? We have a function called get name and it's passed one parameter and that's called request. So the first time we visit the URL, we arrive there via a get request, which will create the empty form instance through the form equals name form. Then it places that in the context via the render method, right? That dictionary like object. Now let's say the user fills out the form and submits it. They would be doing so via the post method so that if statement would return true. So now what is in the body of this if statement would be executed. Create an instance of the form, but this time with the populated data, request.post, the data is now bound to the form. Then the nested if inside of our first if statement checks to see if the data is valid. If the form data is not valid, the form is returned, this time with the bound data, the data the user previously submitted, where they will get prompts to correct the data that is incorrect, that failed validation. If the data is valid, it populates the clean underscore data attribute that we mentioned in the previous slide. This is a dictionary converted into Python types. This will be used to update the database. After all is successful with clean data to the DB, the client is redirected to a new web page and it says, thank you, your data has been submitted. And that's what we see at the bottom. And here we have the template that corresponds to our view for our form itself. So let's look at this from the top down. First, you see that we are extending a base template. That's because we use template inheritance that's beyond the scope of this particular training. And then we have some things called block tags and block tags are where our content goes and we have a class container. This is bootstrap and CSS stuff. It's all about how we present it again, beyond the scope of this particular class. Then we have some regular H2, H4 tags to just show us the my user form, the user form text. That's just free text that we added in. It had nothing to do with our view. It had nothing to do with our form. We added that afterwards. So now we get to those form tags that we mentioned at the beginning of the training. The first thing we see is the form action. And the form action is equal to this URL tag. And in the URL tag, we set it as Yogi Coder colon name. And the reason we do that, it goes back to, and we haven't looked at this yet, the URL pattern. In the URL pattern, we can optionally set, optionally set a name. And we did that. And we, you see here, it says name equals name. And what that does is that tells the browser that the form data should be sent to the URL that's specified. So that simply turns it back to that URL, which links to the view, the view named get underscore name. Then we see the CSRF underscore token tag. That's a very nice feature that Django ships with, and it provides protection against cross-site request forgery. When submitting a form via the post method with CSRF protection enabled, you have to use the CSRF token template tag. All the forms, fields, and their attributes will be unpacked automatically into HTML markup from that one form variable that happens automatically by Django's template language. And then you see at the bottom, we mentioned this earlier, how is it that we have the submit button? Well, now you see where that happens. That input type submit with the value of submit happens right in the template itself. Some other things to take note of, if your form includes a URL field or an email field or an integer type field, Django will use the URL email and number HTML five input types. By default, the browser may apply their own validation on these fields, which may be stricter than Django's validation. If you'd like to disable the behavior, you can. You can set the non-validate attribute on the form tag or specify a different widget on the field, like text input, for instance. So this is template number two that corresponds to our redirect view. This is quite a bit easier. It too extends base.html. You see that as the very first statement. And then all it says is, thanks, 
your form has been sent successfully. That's all it does there. That's all we want it to do. So very straight ahead. And finally, here we have our two URL patterns. These are going to correspond to each of our views. So the first one, number one, the name of this one is name and the path is name. And you see it up in the top screen capture that it's Yogi Coder slash name. And that's that way because I have all my templates in a folder called Yogi Coder. You see the name of the view is get underscore name and it lives in my views file. The second one corresponds to our redirect. Now the pattern here is a little different because it wants to, when it redirects, it wants to build off the previous URL pattern. So we have name and then Yogi Coder thanks. So that's why it looks that way. The view is thanks and thanks lives again in my views file, my views.py. And the name for this view that I gave it was thanks. Very simply, and you see how it corresponds to the screen capture below.